We are honored uh, as producers and hosts of Revolve One Podcast uh, to be invited uh, by the People's Poetry Festival to host this tonight. Um, this has been a great festival. I was able to attend a couple of panels and we had an open mic on Wednesday as part of this as well. So it's just been great to see our community come together around spoken word, prose, authors, and community. And the reality is, is that um, Crystal and I, it's like, what are podcasters doing a part of this? And so our story really brief is Crystal's the writer of the two of us more prolifically. And she had some uh, mental health issues that she was using poetry and prose to work through. Well, and, we have, um, <laughs> and so we, we actually used that to spur a conversation at a local uh, facility, restaurant and bar to host an open mic. And they allowed us to do that around mental health awareness and around poems and prose. And so we've been doing that and, and that's how we met Tom and Dr. Robin and uh, half of you in this room. So we're honored to do yes. that. Uh, but before I invite our, our, our poets up, uh, by the way, the sign-up sheet is over there on that table too. So throughout the night, uh, feel free to do that. Uh, in, in light of the subject matter that we're gonna be speaking of, we'll invite Chuck up here in a minute. I thought it'd be appropriate to have a moment of silence. Uh, the reality is, is that there are um, many, many victims uh, that range beyond uh, the places that we are highlighting today uh, that we that suffer and that have lost their lives in vain in an administration that has seemed to have turned its back on people. And so we as a community have come together, obviously, to remember them and to hope for change as we use words to try to build a bridge rather than walls so if, if you don't mind just briefly for a moment we'll have a moment of silence in honor of those victims and with that we'll invite chuck up to open us up thank you both, uh, so much for being here for letting me speak uh, i'm just going to speak very briefly about how the panel got started, and then um, I'll read my poem. Um, as we began planning, uh, as we always do in, in the fall through People's Poetry Festival, uh, I am a native of El Paso, and um, uh, my, as many families from El Paso, we are of mixed ethnicity, and Patrick Creasius, whose name maybe I shouldn't say, the shooter, came specifically to target mixed families. Uh, he deliberately chose Walmart because there are lots of people there as well. And my nephew happens to work at Walmart. He was not there that day. And if you were to see my nephew, you would think he had just walked out of a, a poster of a Mayan or something like that. He would be would have been very obviously a target for something like that. Um, and I couldn't. I felt guilty about feeling grateful my nephew had been spared because that means somebody else's wasn't, you know? And so, how do you deal with those feelings? You know, um, and it's not just this, I mean, so, uh, so go in Hill, so go in Springs, there's, there have been lots of mass shootings, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's hit us a lot in Texas. So, um, that was the genesis of the, poem, of the panel, and uh, grateful to Tom and the other people who were receptive, and grateful for you all who uh, come and share as well. It's called 600 Miles. 600 miles he drove because there weren't enough Latinos to hate in Dallas. He drove to El Paso, La Frontera, my hometown, to protect what he calls America from invasion. This defender of values pumped lead into a father and mother who threw their bodies across their baby to save her, into a father raising money for his daughter's soccer team and into an elementary school teacher. This protector of America killed an army staff sergeant and a high school student and an 86 year old woman in the checkout line and a grandfather who'd taken his granddaughter to bury, I'm sorry, to buy her a birthday present. 600 miles he drove and stopped at Walmart because he was hungry but he changed his mind and pulled out a rifle instead of a wallet. He drove to my hometown because it's where races mix. 
My beautiful mixed race son is a plague on the purity of his race. He didn't know that my El Paso high school class had Abdus and Abuds and Esquivels and Etheridges sitting next to Garcias and Gilmers and Johnsons mixing with Learners and Composes and Wallaces. 600 miles he drove firing at one of those classmates who survived. Uh, 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 and for those uh, who didn't, I'm sorry, 600 miles he drove, uh, firing one of those classmates who survived, not knowing that all in that class, Arab, Anglo, Chinese, Latino, Black, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, were all praying for that classmate, and for all the others who survived, and for those who didn't, and for our heartbreakingly beautiful city. He missed the point of El Paso that we know each other, we like each other, we get along. 600 miles he drove not knowing that even before the shooting stopped, those mixed people would pull together offering shelter, food, water, that all of us, whatever race, Democrat, Republican, or Partido Nacional Revolucionario would give money, time, heart, our prayers, anything to help. Because mixed people like metal form alloys stronger mixed together than the component parts, stronger than they could possibly be if they stood alone. 600 miles he drove to be arrested by Latino cops, to be charged by a Latino district attorney, to be arranged by a Latino judge. I hope that after a fair trial, they arranged to send him to a nice, frozen, frigid, Aztec version of hell. Thank you. Thank you again, Chuck. That was definitely such a heart wrenching piece. Yeah, a reminder we do have uh, some space on here, but we're going to invite Juan Perez up uh, to read next. Being a school teacher, we have to run through these things in our head and what I do and what the kids do and all those things. Uh, some of the things that we prevented uh, that probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere close to what happened there in the bustle. Uh, I've been the one to get in the middle between things and uh, to stop fights for other teachers, things like that. So I, I imagined the day that this uh, individual went to El Paso. And if I remember correctly, the initial story they said that he had kind of sort of cased an area or went inside and bought something came out or something like that. So I, I, I reimagined this and I reimagined also, I have been reimagining the idea that Mexicans are, are, are kind of, uh, they're called cockroaches. They're brown, they're crawling all over the place, that kind of thing. And for a long time, I've been reimagining those cockroaches into chupacabras instead, being elusive and smart <coughs> jokester. So this whole thing goes into this one poem of reimagining that I'm talking to the individual. Uh, and uh, it, to be honest, it has the same ending as the one you just heard, in a way. So this is cloudy with a chance of chupacabras. You said as you were walking by, hey, look at all those damn fucking cockroaches crawling into that damn fucking Walmart. They must be having one hell of a sell on hard tortilla shells and shit like that. Thinking that I wouldn't care because I did not look Mexican or Latino, Chicano or Hispano, or even look Caucasian enough to upgrade on this second class citizenship you had just assigned me to in your racist mind. Then you ask, you must be Indian, right? Don't you hate all those damn cockroaches jumping over our fucking border and invading our country? I didn't answer it. Whose border? And what cockroaches, bitch? All I see are chupacabras and you, the damn goat I'm about to hand over. Thank you.
Thank you, Juan. <clears throat> Up next, we have Stefan. Thank you. Okay, so background for this story or a prose poem or a poem, oh, I'm not sure what it is, uh, are my mood pool trips to Auschwitz concentration camp and revisiting those trips and things which happen around those events. It's called, I've been to Auschwitz for my mother. It's the early 70s and I'm still a high school student. These are my first vacations alone away from my family, my knapsack, a sleeping bag, a raincoat, few clothes, and many books. Mahatma Gandhi with his stress on the ideal of ahimsa, no harm, no violent resistance. Albert Schweitzer with his insights about the reverence for all life, Mahayana Buddhist Sutras, describing bodhisattvas who postponed their individual liberation and passage <coughs> into Nirvana until they can help us all and many more. It's a hot, sweaty, sunny day, and I hit the road. I hitchhike up the Vistula River to the ancient city of Krakow, then further into the mountains. Auschwitz on my way. The buildings of the main camp are made of red bricks, still look solid. The iron gate welcomes with the inscription, Arbach macht frei, work liberates. Inside, several huge rooms, each filled with belongings of the prisoners. Hair comes razors, eyeglasses, toothbrushes, belts, buckles, prosthetic, shoes, many of them children's shoes and toys. I couldn't speak for several days. Years pass. My mother gives me a tour of Auschwitz and a sister camp of Dzerzhinka. Birch forest. The forest of chimneys spread for miles along the tracks welcomes us. At the end of the war, most barracks were burned down to cover the crimes. Only a few survived and the dead forest of chimneys. Gas chambers at the end of the tracks. Crematoria furnaces right behind all is neat and efficient. More than a million people were killed here. My mother stopped by the crematorium says, sometimes we heard the cries of children who were thrown alive into the furnaces. I want to embrace her, tell her mother I know, but she has already taken off, marches, measures her steps like someone who knows exactly where she is going, so I follow her into one of the barracks. She stops in the front of a small alcove, six feet by six feet, three shelves of wooden planks inside, point to the top one, here's where I slept, she says, alone, I ask, she says, no. Eight, 10 women share the bank, one blanket, sometimes two, it wasn't all bad. <coughs> we cuddle when it was cold.
She lives in the central place where the roll call was taken twice a day. We would stand for hours in cold wind, snow, rain, especially when someone tried to escape, she says. The guards would bring them back and torture them in front of us. We walked slowly to the parking lot. My mother stopped by the wall of the dead, kneels down, pulls out her cherry woods rosary worn thin by the touch of generations. Święta Mario, Matko Boga, módl się za nami grzesznymi teraz i w godzinę naszej śmierci, she whispers, and I pull out my mala blessed by and received from the Dalai Lama and joined her with the Zen chant. Namo. our eyes. Calm mountain tops loom on the horizon. Sometimes it's hard to escape our own prejudice. These two trips have opened my eyes. I had already known that all humans are one kin, one family. I had already known that in some fundamental sense, spiritually, ethically, we are all equal. After all, even then I was a student of philosophy, but why to stop there I start to wonder. Jewish Nobel Prize laureate Isaac Bashevi Singer, whom I read himself a survival of Holocaust, wrote that in our relations to animals all people are Nazis, and that from animal point of view it is all eternal trembling. And now his words hit me like proverbial track straight into my proverbial eyes. The methods used by the Nazis to gather and kill humans were based on what we do in slaughterhouses. The same efficiency, the same neglect of their misery. Even the train carts used to transport prisoners were originally used to move animals. But if what the Nazis did to humans was so profoundly wrong, does it not follow that what we do to humans is just as wrong? I tried various objections, beginning with the most obvious. We are humans, they are animals, but being a human is basically a matter of having genes. That's what racists do. They base morality on genes. Then I tried an idea borrowed from Immanuel Kant. Morality is a matter of rational consent. Well, Nazis were killing children too. Some of them so severely mentally handicapped they would never be able to consent to anything. The Kantian idea, miserable failure. And morality cannot be based simply on what our culture permits. If it were, we could not rationally reject Nazis. So it dawned on me, Gandhi H. Weiser were right. Fundamentally, morality is about respect for all life. Right there and then, I resolved not to harm anybody. Sometimes it's hard to escape hatred and anger. During the meeting with the Dalai Lama, when he blessed and gave me mala, the Buddhist rosary, he also told a story about someone who escaped from occupied Tibet and he visited him in Dharmasala. What was the hardest thing for you to do? The Dalai Lama asked, and a newly arrived monk answered, not to hate people who tortured me. That was the hardest. Like my mother, my father too was captured after the Warsaw Uprising. Seemingly more lucky escaped from transport to Auschwitz. So he did not have to suffer the atrocities of the camp. Still, the events of the war had an impact. There was some deeply seated anger in him. Sometimes he damaged, something got damaged and never healed. 
Sometimes she would spend hours chain smoking cigarettes and drinking himself to sleep. He had never escaped shadows of his past. Somehow, my mother not only survived Auschwitz, but also emerged unbroken and stronger than ever. Her heart big enough to embrace not only us, but also many other children and many stray cats and dogs and even many doves with broken wings and legs. Sometimes I wonder <laughs> about these ideas of Akimsa. Was it Gandhi? Was it Schweizer? Or was it my mother? Year passed again. She and I sit together in her tiny apartment overlooking the Vistula River. We watched the trial in Nuremberg a documentary about the Nazis' crimes about humanity and their trial after the war. Hermann Göring, second in Reich only to Hitler, claims to be oblivious to what happened in the camp. My mother says, let's take a walk along the river while geese may need food. Remember, we do have a sign of Chi up here. We have a few more names that we're going to go through. Tom, we're going to invite Tom up next, but there are some spaces that are available. <laughs> I was just texted the power's out of my house, so um, <laughs> we'll see what happens here. Healing. These hands are unfit to heal. What hands like these have wrought? In the mass shootings of Sutherland Springs, El Paso and Midland, Odessa, burning hatred-loaded guns, blood in the pews, blood in the aisles, blood in the streets, blood in our minds. Like Herostratus of Ephesus, who burned the temple of Artemis. Let us forget their names, their weapons, their angers. Let us celebrate the lives of their wrath. Let us remember Jordan Anchanado, who shielded her baby Paul. Let us remember the babies, the elderly, the Mexicans, the children, the lonely, the lovers, the parents, the unborn, those that are gone forever. Let us not forget that these murders are us. Let us not forget to temper ourselves when life crumbles around our feet. Let us not forget to love. Let us not forget our hearts are stronger, beating right now to the rhythm of sorrow, to the rhythm of joy, to the rhythm of our joint presence, to the rhythm of hope of a future. Maybe then our hearts and minds will free hands like these and will help these hands become fit to heal. So much Tom just remember we do have a sign up sheet right over there on that table you also feel free yeah, Javier. Javier. hello very much <clears throat> you know all, although I was born in the United States I uh, was raised in Mexico just across the river by my great-grandparents. One of the uh, traditions and practices that uh, take place among, in our community is that uh, when one family doesn't have enough kids or children to take care of the elderly, like in our case, my grandparents did not have children of their own. My father uh, 
took me when I was two years old to be raised by them. Uh, and my great grandparents, uh, they were shareholders. And they must have had about, I would say, seven to nine uh, acres uh, next to a floodplain by the river, by the river's edge. And uh, we would go and hang to that uh, agricultural plot. And for lunch, we would go down to the river and eat lunch under the willows uh, and enjoy the uh, fresh, cool water of the river. Uh, <coughs> and um, a few months ago, I he wrote a poem that came out in Spanish. <coughs> and I did a, I made a translation um, into English. Uh, it's called the willows, uh, and for me the willows, it's a metaphor for the river. <clears throat> the willows. The willows sway along the river, step into shallows with open arms, and whisper from time to time. A measured humming hovers in the breeze while pateros drift across the sleeping serpent, pushing hidden shadows off the carrizal. A flock of house sparrows pierces the obsidian night, chasing feeding fields on the other side. Camouflage harriers perched on mesquites pounce on them at first strands of light. Tango in fear, a handful scuffle away. Feathers flutter on the spines of nopaleras. The day bleeds beyond the sunrise, and alas blancas echo another song. Startled, the willows shudder. The river scurries downstream the wind scramble away. Peregrines drift the free-flowing skies. Coyotes crack the stone-cold silence. All of them wait, wait, wait for another day. Thank you. Brother. Thank you, Javier. Up next, we have P.W. Covington. Weight of the thing. It is the weight of the thing, the dark, deadly, machined, final, and explosive, soul, undeniable weight. In the palm of my hand, the power and the wrath that it loans me to pump vengeance into those I deem deserving or to cancel my own inadequacies, a place to hold on to hope, to control both for as long as I can, the weight of believing that all my bets can be covered with the right talents, with the right technology with enough skill for the full load caught with fury and failure in the chamber stoned alone in bed I'm fascinated and repulsed by the weight of the thing in the palm of my hand. Thank you very much.
much. I just want to say before we say the next name, it, Crystal and I is privilege and honor to be a part of this, to be invited uh, to help host this. Remember, we're from Revolver Podcast, so be sure you subscribe and like. Who do we got next? Chris? Up next, we have Robin. Robin, Doctor. Thank you, Crystal and Whitney and uh, Tom and Susan and all the poets and poet friends and family um, for being here and for such an amazing a poetry festival gathering. This is called Stray. <clears throat> she came howling for food on the porch in June. Tufts of gray-white hair sprung from her bird-like strut, huffing a claim for herself as if she could conjure the rain. In this drought-struck town, boarded up houses marked foreclosed. On this small plot of land, I'd come back to save books in my heart with my name on them. On these sun-baked planks on this yellow scab yard, I'd watched her streak across the street, Tomcat tearing up her dust. Her screech had stiffened the humid night. She'd come for three seasons, gulp my leftovers beneath the red hibiscus, swish her smoky plume of tail, brush by me like a petal, and be gone. In early April, I found her under the moonlight, her right eye gouged and black and crusted, draining green as if the moon had wept. Hard news struck morning. The vet showed a pellet lodged in her thin neck, the entrance wound her blown eye. As I buried her that night, children played in the yard next door. Her milk had been dry, the litter likely starved to death. I couldn't hear myself think about them, just the children's voices scratching the hot air, loud and bored. My turn, my turn. <clears throat> bouncing on the trampoline, their big, thin skulls bobbing on their string bean bodies, soon to be loose on the planet, roaming beneath the faint moon, still bearing earthshine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robin. Up next, we have Alan. And remember, we do have a few more spots. Yes, y'all feel free to sign up. <clears throat> Nuts, guys, I hate breaking rules, but I can't decide between two poems. Um, so we'll do uh, a, an older one and then a new one about El Paso. Torched Memories of Atlanta. In this nation, after the president from hope and the president of hope, in this nation of brotherhood from sea to shining sea that festers with Aryan brothers and hoods, shining hate with torches and flaming crosses, fanned by a president who feigns ignorance, the sea of hope ebbs low. So I ask you to remember that when the world last came to the South, the torch was not born by Nathan Bedford Forrest or David Duke, but the frail and shaking Muhammad Ali who lit a flame that can still enlighten us all. And a new one I, I, I wrote for El Paso border lies. Men on the moon saw the earth, saw the earth rise above the horizon. Above the horizon, the earth hung fragile and blue, 
hung fragile and blue without borders. Without borders, a city once grew from Juarez, from Juarez across the Rio Grande. Across the Rio Grande, El Paso sits. El Paso sits six miles from Fort Bliss. Fort Bliss, home of 40,000 soldiers. 40,000 soldiers ready to protect, ready to protect against credible threats, credible threats to national security. National security can be threatened from within, threatened from a man, from within by a man with a Sharpie. A man with a Sharpie can change any map, change any map and lies become real. Lies become real and the world went to hell. Hell came to El Paso when one man believed, believed that one man could do what 40,000 soldiers couldn't, couldn't stop an invasion that did not exist. An invasion that did not exist was stopped in a bloodbath, in a bloodbath in El Paso. Lies and hate bear no witness bear no witness to what men on the moon once learned, learned the earth, fragile and blue, has no borders. Very profound, thank you, Alan. Next is Edward Vidal Arde. Justicia. I wanted to write a love poem, but the cries of slaughtered rabbits made me write of border violence. I wanted to write a poem about a serene river, but the dark waters reflected the faces of newly orphaned children trapped in a stash house, begging to die amongst the monarch butterflies. I almost wrote a poem about hate, Instead, I picked up a knife and tore through every tree in Texas, leaving nothing but a sap and blood trail. I wanted to write a poem to a child, but 20 voices cried out, that's not fair. Instead, I watched my daughter eat ice cream and spoke to her in a whisper about angels. I wanted to write a poem about growing up, but my mother's tears dripping into the caldo de res the soft humming of the refrigerator and the blank pages on the coffee table stunted all growth. I wanted to, I wrote a poem about survival. Justicia is her name. Thank you so much, Edward. Up next, we have Karen. Sorry, give me a second. I lost my page marker. So, I don't know if you can see this group. I always do write entirely too much, sorry. <laughs> oh, there it is. It doesn't have a title, so. In fourth grade, we were told it was impossible to draw a straight line without a ruler. My pencil traced pale blue lines, training myself to create the perfect line proving I was beyond those rules, for my lines never progressed beyond arching curves, distended ends with a feeble spider web of lines softly arching across the paper. In ninth grade geography, we learned about the borders of states, dutifully traced the rivers which divided east from west before heading south into the Gulf of Mexico. Even the dry states with perfect seeming lines were never drawn straight, impossible to have a border 
on a mountain, pencil unsteady, walking in two lands at once. In college, I questioned the idea of lines and borders, arbitrary scribblings on napkins by old men with no ruler to guide them, conceding land which wasn't theirs to see, not once using their own feet to walk the mountains, swim in the rivers, to intimately know the lines scribbled on the page between two points. We use these lines as gospel, not geometry, sure in our ability to decipher one land from another, plotting lines on paper, no ruler required, just rule of law distended to the breaking point. Thank you, Karen. We're gonna have Savannah coming up next.
<laughs> We've got a few more minutes uh, left, so feel free. There's a couple of blanks after this because I think we only have one more sign up. Crystal's going to tell us who that is right now. Up next, we have Miguel. So feel free, we've got a few more minutes if you can help me out. How's it going? Um, so I'm in Dr. Carstensen's poetry class, and she assigned us to write a poem about something we saw in the news. Um, that same weekend, Kobe Bryant had passed away in a helicopter crash, which was very tragic, but something that did get swept under the rug in the midst of that was an attack on the United States Iranian embassies where several people were killed, um, some missiles made contact, and I wrote this in response to that. They make their missiles to bomb our bases and send their soldiers to shoot our men. They hate us there, and this we know. We forced them to be our fighting foes. Instead of leaving them alone, we make our missiles to bomb their bases and send our soldiers to shoot their men. This war we fight will never end. Thanks again to everybody that came out tonight. Again, we do have a few more minutes, so I want to open it up. Anybody would like to sign up? There's still time. There's still time, yes. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. nothing but time, right? <laughs> well, do you have anything? I don't have anything on me uh, at this present moment. Crystal? You <laughs> <laughs> can look at my archives. Here. That's that we're at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> She's technology at its finest, right? So Crystal does have something that she would like to share. Excuse me if I get a tad emotional reading it. It is called The Store. It is the year 2019, and there have been shootings against neighbors, classmates, and even strangers as far back as I can recall. However, now it seems there are random shootings happening at every corner, in every classroom, at every store, and everywhere in between. We see it constantly in the news, through our text alerts, in our news feed, desensitized to it all, when we should be fighting to feel this intense pain that quickly recedes. I do not understand this senseless violence, and I'm fairly certain those committing it do not understand it much either. Can we not walk down our street without getting shot at? Can we not send our kids to school without a lockdown as bullets start flying? Can we not go to the store merely to buy the food and goods we need? No, no we cannot. As when we turn into aisle nine, we hear the loud pops over and over and over again. Do we run or do we hide? People begin screaming, children are confused and crying. The once innocent maze of the grocery store becomes a disorienting battlefield. I hear shots going off still, with round after round being fired. Turning the corner as I head for the exit, I see the man wielding his weapon. We lock eyes for just a moment as he takes aim at my chest. I need to run and jump to take cover. However, that moment of a shock stare was enough to paralyze my body over my own adrenaline. I feel the sting of a bullet right below my neck. In this instant, I feel the warmth of blood spill over my body. And as I lay on the cold floor, all I can think is milk, bread, dog food, and eggs. Usually I make a list, but I figured this would be a short trip. Little did I know then that this would be my last trip to the store I once felt safe in. Thank you. Follow that, but you're more than welcome to. Uh, but 
Tom, I'm going to hand this over to you. I don't know if there is anything or anybody else would like to uh, sign up. We have a few minutes. Again, again, Crystal and I, absolutely privileged and honored uh, to have been a part of this and to play one small piece in it. And we are so honored to have met many of you and know some of you and continue your work uh, because it truly is inspiring others and changing people's lives. Yes, we love being a part of the community. So thanks so much. Can we get a hand? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's it. We have a uh, nice atmosphere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>